Right. So, hello. My name is Rolf Smets. Uh, I'm the product owner of the Vadin Design System, which makes me responsible for our components, the Luma theme, and things like that. Uh, with me today, I have Jusa Kantanen, who is the team lead for the UX team uh, on our consulting side of the company. So his team helps, can help uh, all of you with uh, theming, with uh, UX design, stuff like that. So we're going to be talking about how to nail the handoff. So let's start with defining what we mean by the handoff. Um, in the traditional sense, at least, the handoff is the ritual where uh, the designer is done with doing the designs for some part of the UI. He's probably added some annotations to those mockups or wireframes and uh, he hands them over to the developers for implementation, possibly together with some separate UI specifications for, with details like how something should work and whatever technical details they, they might need to convey. And um, then the developer implements that. And do we, by the way, have any designers here today? <coughs> No, I didn't expect that, no. <laughs> this is not that kind of a conference. Um, but I'm sure we have people here who work with designers, who manage designers or work with designers on a regular basis, right? Can we see a raise of hands? Yeah, white men. So I don't really, when I say designer in this talk, I'm, I'm not really meaning designers who have people who have a design degree or people who have designer in their title or even anybody who does uh, design on a daily basis necessarily. I really just mean anybody who does the design or anybody who plans what the UI should be like. And that could be a developer, that could be a business analyst, that could be, a, oh God, a product manager. Um, perish the thought, but it could be anybody. And so this is not about designers in the strict sense, but designers in the sense whoever does the design. So that's what the handoff is about. And we have three tips today that we want to share with you about how to nail the handoff. And then one bigger tip that kind of wraps it all together. And tip number one is don't do handoffs. And we could just end it there. And uh, thank you, do you have any questions? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, um, maybe you meet, need a bit more meat on the bones um, despite just having had lunch. Um, I kind of have a problem with the term handoff because it implies that the designer is handing off the responsibility for whatever happens next together with the design materials. He's, he's done and you know, that's now it's the developer's problem, what happens next. Um, I call this the fire and forget model of designer developer collaboration. The designer has handed over the mockups, the wireframes, the annotations, the specifications, whatever to the developers and they disappear in a puff of smoke. Has anybody had a feeling that this is kind of how it sometimes happens? Have you felt that this is? Yeah, I see some nodding, yeah. Um, I am um, guilty as charged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I worked for um, eight years as a designer in the team that you also is now running. And uh, before I joined over to the dark side uh, as a product owner. Before that, I worked for many years as a developer. So I've been on both sides of this situation. I've been that developer who is left trying to piece things together when the designer has flown to the moon or whatever. Um, and I've been the designer who has disappeared in a puff of smoke. Um, I, I used to do that 
in the first few years as, I, as a designer. And I, I quickly noticed that that didn't usually lead to the best end results in projects. And I think part of the problem is the term handoff because it really sounds like you're handing off, bye, that's it. And that's just not a way, very good optimal way of doing things. Uh, when the designer is doing his work, he should not be working in isolation. He should be working in a constant feedback loop with the developers. And also vice versa. When the developers start working on the implementation, they should have the designer, if not, not right next to them, then close to hand. Because there is no such thing as a perfect design. There is no such thing as a design that needs no adjustments at all once you get to implementing it. There are always going to be things that once the developers start working on it, they realize that, oh, this is a bit difficult or this simply isn't doable. Or things that are totally perfectly fine in the designs and totally implementable, but once you start trying it out, it, you realize that the UX is terrible. And so during development, during implementation, there will need to be adjustments done and uh, you might as well do them together because the developer has the best understanding of the technical side of things and the designer probably, hopefully, has the best understanding of what the user needs, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of working in silos, uh, the design and development really should be in a constant feedback loop from the beginning of the design process to the end of the implementation process. And of course, ideally, if you have testers, then those should also be part of that same feedback. So Jonas, I, I took a picture of Jonas's presentation from earlier today uh, because I found this one slide just put it so well. An empowered team owning the full solution is more productive. Now, I think Jonas was mainly talking about backend developers and frontend developers, but we could say the same thing also about designers and all those developers and maybe others in the team as well. An empowered team, including designers, who own the full solution is more productive than one that, one that doesn't. And of course, I know that many companies have um, pretty strict silos between design and development, especially bigger companies tend to have separate departments where the designers do their work and a different department, a different cost center, a different part of the building where the developers do their work. And that makes it pretty difficult to actually make this happen. Uh, I've been to companies as a consultant where it was almost impossible for the developers to even gain access to the de designers and talk to them directly, one-to-one. -one. And, uh, uh, I mean, yes, you should change that company culture. But I think if you are in that kind of a situation, if you are working for a company that has silos that deep, has walls that tall between teams, between professions, if the doors are locked and there are armed guards outside, there's one word for that. You should use ventilation shafts to crawl between the, the departments. Don't let that stop you because nobody is going to punish you if you talk across departmental boundaries to get your work done better. Design and development should work in continuous collaboration. So you shouldn't do handoffs in the traditional sense, but instead you should work together. Now that doesn't mean that there isn't a point in time when uh, the designer is dominantly done with their work on that particular feature or view. Of course there is. There's a point in time when they figure that, well, this is good enough now. I'm going to start working on something else. And the developer says, okay, then, then I'll start building this thing. Uh, let's call that the handoff. 
but let's just be aware that that is not some kind of huge dividing line between two pieces of work that shall never meet. There should be a blurry kind of line where most of the work is done by the designer first and then most of the work is done by the developer. So with that said, let's go over to tip number two. Thank you. So the next topic is uh, UI stack awareness. And almost all in, in development projects, the UI stack that is gonna be used in, in the implementation is already known before the designer starts working on a design or before the UI designs get, get specified. Uh, this is true in also not only existing applications, but in brand new applications, the development teams have their prefers, preferred UI stacks. I'm guessing that in this group, it's quite common that Vardin is your uh, weapon of choice. So the designers should be also aware of that. So as you know, Vardin has roughly 50 components. They're, they're a good set of components uh, that get the, get the job done. Uh, sometimes you might need to adjust them, them a bit, but the problem that we often, often see is that the designer who did a design for a Vardin application or Vardin based application wasn't aware of these components or weren't aware of their capabilities. Or if they were, uh, didn't know that the uh, UI, UI is gonna be based on Vardin, maybe they didn't quite understand what it means or they simply didn't, didn't care. They had their own way of, of working. So they might start working from, from scratch instead of using the, using the 50 already existing components. So that's of course a lot of, lot of overhead in the, in the work. Or if they, if they did know about the components, maybe they're not, they were not familiar enough with the components. They didn't know what kind of variations exist, what's the functionality of the components, where the limits are. So there's this lack of alignment with the, with the tech stack, lack of alignment with the designs and the, and the uh, implementation. So as, the, as a result of this, the uh, designs are gonna be unnecessarily difficult to implement. The developers either need to use a significant effort to follow the designs, start making customizations, or they will simply start deviating from the designs. So neither case is, is really good. Here we have uh, two date pickers shown. The right one is the Vardin date picker. And on the left one, we have uh, like a custom, custom design. This might be something that you get from a, from a designer. It might be based on their previous ex experience that this is a good, good way to uh, define a, a date picker. There's some differences between the two. Uh, the one on the left, has pagination. Also, it has a very big button at the bottom of the, of the overlay for selecting the value. The uh, field itself has a outline border style and that's intersecting with the label of the field. And the field itself is split into these three uh, sub fields. This is gonna be quite challenging to implement in Vardin for a number of reasons. So there's no way uh, to make the calendar overlay paginated in Vardin. There's no way of simply adding this button. The selection logic of the dates is, is, is different from this. And also there's no, no way of splitting the input into, into three. The outline border is doable, but it takes quite heavy CSS uh, styling, custom styling which uh, of course causes maintenance overhead. You need to uh, check that all the different states of the input field are, are covered and, and so on. The uh, intersected label that it works with different backgrounds and, and so on. So there's a lot of, lot of work getting it done. So what happens uh, uh, with, a, with a design like this? The developer has to make some pretty difficult uh, choices. So first of all, they might try to customize the component styling to match with the requirements. 
they might tweak the components functionality to meet with, meet with the design. They might go as far, far as forking the original component and applying their customization on top. But doing this, you will lose the, lose the connection to the original component. You might uh, integrate a third party component, something outside of the Vardin, Vardin components and do a, a, a Java API of that. Or you might start building something completely new from scratch. And going from top to bottom, the effort uh, increases all the time. So styling is relatively cheap and simple. Building components ground up from scratch is, is really time consuming. And there's more. We have been now been talking about uh, individual components, but it also applies to like compositions. So if you're not working with a, with a completely new fresh project, you already have some patterns probably that exist in there. You might have card component defined in your application. Probably the views use some uh, templates or patterns that are, that are commonly seen in there. So if the designer is not aware of these existing things, they will also not be basing their designs on, on these. So sometimes it, it is relevant that sometimes you need to deviate from the, from the standard components. So for example, the Vardin date picker isn't the ideal for all the possible date filling use cases that might exist. If your focus is on, on one single month uh, at, at a time, maybe the design on the left is, is more optimized towards that. Or if you're entering a known date, like your own birth date, you don't really benefit much from, from a calendar in the first place. So you just want to prioritize the typing in the numbers. But the decision to deviate from the standard component should be always a conscious choice. So it should be based on awareness of what are the limits of the existing components, what features already exist. And once making that decision to deviate from the standards, one needs to understand that it will be creating uh, like significant work for, for the whole team. And also the maintenance effort is gonna be increased in like longer term that you can uh, maintain those choices as well. So if the designer is not aware what are the limits of the existing components, they, it cannot be a conscious choice that, okay, now we are deviating from that. So how to promote the uh, awareness about the, about the selected UI stack? First of all, you should ensure that the uh, designers are, are aware of the existing components. The designers should be familiar with the features and variants and stylability of the components. Nowadays, the Vardin uh, component documentation is pretty good in, in, in this, that it showcases all the, all the different features and the variants of the, of the components. And also in uh, one in 24 documentation, now uh, we've added, or Rolf's team has worked hard to add the uh, styling documentation, documenting all the different states and, and stylable parts of the components. And if the designers are using Figma, they should definitely be using the Vardin, Vardin Figma library. So a few words on Figma. It is the most used uh, design tool currently. It's the, it's the market leader in its own, own space. It runs in a, in a browser, so it's really good for seamless collaboration. Uh, people can view the files, edit the files without having to install any, any software. It is a graphic design tool still as of, as of today, but it has been going into this direction of tighter integration with, with code. There is like an inspect uh, mode or a dev mode inside Figma, which uh, can show you some documentation that the uh, Figma components have in them. You can output some CSS from, from Figma. Also, you can do these interactive click-through prototypes in, in Figma, which helps uh, defining uh, interactions and, and doing prototypes. So what you see on screen starts to be very close to what, what your finished application would be like. Also, I want to say a few words about uh, what Figma isn't. So it isn't a low code editor. It doesn't have any connection to the web components or any other components per se. So it cannot export code. It doesn't really do logic in that sense. And 
the reason why, why I'm talking about Figma is the Vardin, Vardin Figma library. So it's free to use for everyone. It can be found in the uh, Figma community, which is their own uh, file sharing, file sharing uh, space. You don't need to have a Figma subscription to get sta started with the, using the file. It has all the uh, around 50 Vardin components drawn out the pixel, re pixel perfect representations of those components. Also, we've done uh, quite, a lot of, uh, put quite a lot of effort in making those customizable, resizable, styleable using the auto layouts, etc. So you can really make it, make it your own. And as I said, it goes beyond just static images. So it's a good tool for prototyping interactions. So it's super easy to make pixel perfect and beautiful Vardin based UIs and click through prototypes. Personally, I can say that it has freed a significant amount of time to uh, focus on like solving users' issues instead of drawing gray rectangles that look like a, a button, for example. So less drawing, more designing. Right. Then we have the third tip about handoffs, which is not really about handoffs itself, but about how you do design and development in general of the UI. So most application UIs and especially most business application UIs don't consist of gazillions of totally unique features. Instead, they tend to be made up out of a, a relatively small set of reusable recurring patterns that are repeated over and over again all over the UI. As an example, you're probably all aware that the Vardin button comes in a few different types of uh, color variants. And this is a very common thing in application UI. So typically there's a default button or a secondary button as we call it. There's a primary button that has a more prominent styling to draw attention to the most important features or functions uh, in the UI. There's ghost or tertiary buttons that are less prominent than the standard button. And then there's often a uh, special colored button for dangerous or destructive actions. So the red one at the bottom here. Similarly, uh, there are often a relatively small amount of different types of views in a business application. Most business applications consist of maybe four or so types of views. There's the master detail view, which is a split between a list and the details or, or, or editing of that list item. There's uh, just a tabular view that opens a dialogue for editing stuff. There's a plain form view that just consists of a form and there's some kind of card view or dashboard. Those are the four most common types of views in business applications. And even within these four views, there are a lot of commonalities. They all have a header bar at the top with a title and some buttons. They have a footer at the bottom with the main actions of that view. And in the middle, there's a content area. So even within those four views, you can generalize it down into this. And most designers do think in terms of these recurring patterns. And even most people who just do UI design or plan the UI who are not really designers per se, tend to go for similar solutions for similar problems. And that's a good thing because recurring patterns create consistency and consistency is good for the user experience. The problem is that Mo many designers fail to convey these recurring patterns to the developers. So when designers do the handoff materials, they typically annotate their designs with you know, red lines, pointing to different parts of the UI, connecting them with some text describing various details. And what we see very often is red lines or annotations like this. They point out things like color codes. 
that say that you should use this specific CSS color code for this for the button uh, text here. And sure, the designer is kind of trying to help be helpful here, uh, but this color code doesn't really convey to the developer what type of button this is, why this button has a red text. The developer is, the designer is hardly thinking, oh, let's just use this random red color. They're not pulling that out of thin air. They're probably thinking that this is a danger button and that's why it should have a red text. And even, in, even the specific hue of red that they use here is probably not random. They probably have a palette that they're working off of. Most business applications have a very limited palette of maybe 20 or so colors that are repeated over and over again. So the problem is that instead of saying this is a danger button and all danger buttons should have this color code for the text, the de designer is just pointing out that this button should have a red text. So when the developer gets this and it's time to implement, they might just apply that color code to the button because that's the information they got. And the problem with this is, there are a lot of problems with this. One of them is that if they need to do this for every single danger button separately, that's a lot of duplicated code. Also, it's going to be really difficult to modify later on when somebody decides that, oh, we should use a different shade of red. Also, when you read this code, it doesn't really tell you that this is a danger button. You just see a color code and most people can't map color codes in their brains to actual colors. So, okay, developers are smart people. You all know, don't repeat yourself, the dry principle. And so, of course, most developers notice that, oh, I've seen this red button before, this is a recurring thing. So let's implement it in a reusable way. So for example, they might use, they might introduce a CSS variable, dash dash danger button color. Or they might introduce a CSS class, danger, that they apply to the button. Or they might introduce an enum, if this is a flow application. They might use an enum to avoid having to spell that class name correctly every time. Or they might even create a subclass of the button component that has that color applied automatically. All of these are fine. The problem is then that, you know, one developer does this, but the other developers are not aware. So, okay, maybe the next developer sees a red button and thinks, oh, this is a recurring thing. This is a destructive button. Let's look in the code base for the word destructive to find the implementation of the destructive button. They can't find it because it's called danger button by the other developer. Now we have duplicate implementations because they just made their own. A uh, third problem with this is that what if there are variations of that pattern? Let's say it's something a bit more complex than a color code. Let's say it's a card component. Vadin doesn't have a card component yet. Um, so it has an image at the top, a title, some text, and a buttons, some buttons at the bottom. This is like the standard card, but it can also come without those buttons. It can also come without that text. Um, sometimes the card needs to be in a sidebar like this, and the designer has decided that this, there's a, a bit too much visual noise there. They want to simplify it a bit, so they introduce a style variant that looks like that. Or maybe they want to use that same style variant for mobile use, which you know, don't really have a card layout per se, it's just a single column of cards, so they also want to skip those shadows and borders and whatnot. So how is the developer to know? First of all, when he sees the first card, how is he to know that it should also support all of these variations? And then when another developer sees this card that doesn't really look like the other card, how should they know that it's the same thing? and that they should be using the same uh, implementation. It doesn't really help that the designer is being super helpful and annotates the heck out of that wireframe. <laughs> because they now have to do that for every single place where there is a card. Now again, 
Developers know, don't repeat yourself. They notice this is a recurring pattern. They might even ask the designer some questions about, well, this card thing, what are some variations that the card needs to support? They might even go out of their way and let the other developers know that, oh, hey, I built a card. Um, but we still have a problem because this is still now the responsibility of every single developer individually. This is not systematic. This is ad hoc patterns. So the problem with ad hoc patterns, non-systematic use of patterns and reusable components is that the handoff materials need to be kind of heavy because you need to have a lot of annotations for every single detail. You have to explain a lot for every single view. Only some of the recurring patterns will be identified because none of this is, all of this is basically down to luck. Only some of the recurring features will actually be implemented as reusable components or CSS variables or whatever. Some patterns will get duplicate implementations because developers are not aware of existing implementations. And some of the implementations will not be able to accommodate all of the variations that, or features that they need to support. There's going to be code bloat, duplicate code leads to code bloat, and it's going to be difficult to modify. So what could we do instead? Well, the designer could instead just say, card, this is a card, and this is a card. They just point out that this pattern is known as a card, and then that card is defined, documented somewhere else not just anywhere, not in the specifications for that particular view, because this is not a view specific thing. This needs to be somewhere that is easy to find whenever you're looking for a card. It could be an internet site of some kind, it could be a wiki, it could be in Confluence, it could be in a Google <coughs> Drive document, uh, it could be you know, in a PDF if you really want to. Um, the important thing is that you can search for card in whatever knowledge base you use and then you can find the definitions, all of these annotations and whatnot, all of the variations of the card component, all of the behaviors and functions it needs to support. Those need to be documented somewhere where developers and designers both can find them. So that will then help developers implement this thing once in a reusable way. So what this really boils down to is to have a systematic approach to UI. It's kind of a methodology really for UI design and development that goes something like this. You identify patterns in the designs. You define those patterns properly, you give them names and you document them somewhere. And the designer should not be doing this alone they should be doing this with at least some developer because the developer might have insights and opinions about all of this stuff. And then you should implement those patterns as reusable components or CSS variables or class names or whatever using the same names as you have in the documentation and the same names as you have in the designs because that will help people find the correct implementation and not end up with duplicate implementations. And then you build the UI based on those uh, patterns that are implemented as reusable components. I'm not saying this should be happen as a waterfall process, obviously. Uh, I'm saying it should happen iteratively in a cyclical manner for each view or each feature separately. So the design process goes something like this. I hope you can read the text, by the way, it's a bit small. Um, I'll read you through it. So the designer starts working on something. They ask themselves, do we already have a pattern that matches what we need to do here? If we do, let's reuse the pattern, yay. If we don't have a pattern for this, do we expect this to be a recurring thing? If yes, then we need to go through a bit more work. We need to define that pattern. We need to give it a name. We need to document it and so on. But then it's done. If we don't expect it to be a recurring pattern, if it's a unique unicorn, then fine. Unique unicorns are okay. You don't have to 
repeat everything. You don't have to always grab whatever you already have. You can create new stuff. You need to create new stuff. Otherwise, you would never have anything. So let's say it's a unique unicorn. Fine. We'll just design a one-off thing. And then we're done. Now, of course, defining that new reusable pattern is a lot of work. You need to do more work to define that pattern properly than to just include it in a design somewhere. But the more you do that, the more patterns you have defined, the more often you can use, take the easy route because you already have that pattern. And you can just reuse that pattern. That's a lot less work. And the same thing goes for the implementation side. It's the exact same process. You start implementing something, you ask yourself, is this a uh, pattern that we have here? It, it, or is, what, what, what the thing that I'm seeing in the design is, is this already an implemented pattern? It, do we already have a component or something for it? If yes, let's reuse it. If no, is this going to be a recurring thing? Yes, then let's implement it as a recurring reusable component. And if not, then just if it's a unique unicorn, then let's implement a unique unicorn. That's fine too. And again, implementing these patterns as reusable components with all the variants and all everything that they need to support, not just for that one view, but in all of the various ways they might be used elsewhere. That's a lot more work than just doing a one-off implementation. But the more you do it, the less you need to do it, and the more often you can take the easy path. So what this means is that in the beginning of this process, when you start working on a project, you're going to have to spend a bit more effort, a lot more effort, to be honest, because you need to define all those patterns because you have nothing. Well, you have the voting components, but other than that, you have nothing. So we have to start defining, naming, documenting all of those patterns. And then the developers need to start implementing those patterns as components before they can use them. But when you, you reach a certain point, your velocity starts to go up, your effort starts to go down, as you can start reaping the benefits of those patterns, when you can just start using them. And the further you go, the, more, the less actual work you need to do. You can just keep using what you already have. So the benefits of this whole thing to the handoff process, which is what we're talking about here today, is that you need minimal annotations in your mockups. You need minimal UI specifications per view because most of the stuff in each view is a recurring thing that is already defined elsewhere. And your designs generally don't need to be as high fidelity. They can be, you know, sketches on the back of a napkin if you want, as long as the patterns are reasonably easy to identify there. So for example, the annotations could be at, at, at the maximum, something like this. We're just pointing out patterns. We're pointing out things that probably are already components. We have a list view component, which is used for all the list view type views. We have a uh, money range field that we have already implemented. We have a filter table, which is already perfectly well understood by de de designers and developers because it's well defined. So we're just pointing out things that are maybe not super obvious. And in most cases, we could probably skip half of these annotations as well. So we have a case study on this. Yep. So it's now been a few, few years ago when we were working together with Rolf on a, on a project and there we took this approach to quite an quite an extreme so we had a challenge that uh, we were uh, doing designs for an application that had hundreds of views many of those views were very complex so we had to use a lot of effort in clarifying the business requirements what, what is it that the UI should be actually doing how to best serve the users in, in getting their job done and design was kind of coming a, a bottleneck. We had a, a team of developers that we were supposed to be serving, so we had to pick up more velocity. Yeah, we had seven developers uh, in the team and two designers working yeah. on it. And, and, and we were using this pattern-based approach, but there were so many views and they, the views were so complex that even though we had these patterns defined, it was a lot of work for us 
to create those annotations and pointing out all of the patterns, like all of the gazillions of patterns that, that they were made up. Yeah, so we had to streamline the annotation process somehow. So to pass the information to the developers more quickly. And we did create our own notation for documenting the structures. So it does look a bit like a HTML tree, but the difference is that uh, it's meant to be read by a human instead of a browser. So it's designed to be super quick to write. We are uh, skipping all the parentheses and, and, and so on brackets from it. And it is describing a view in matter of patterns, repeatable UI patterns. Not low level HTML components, not web components, but just high level patterns that both the designer and the developer understand that are not technical constructs, but like design yeah. items. If you start uh, looking into this, what, what is this made of? So we have the uh, master detail layout. So that consists of a master area, a detail, a detail area, and a movable splitter in between. So we have all already defined and implemented this, this pattern earlier. So we didn't have to explain the layout of, of a master detail layout. We didn't uh, have to specify the interactions, nor the styling. The styling came out to be quite, quite useful because the developers didn't want to touch CSS as they were building the views. So all of that already came with the defined patterns. So um, <clears throat> if we move uh, deeper in the, in the notation, we have a data table. And that has uh, two slots for components. The first one is a header toolbar. This is also uh, documented in the, in the documentation, uh, what type of actions can be where, what, how is the alignment done for, for different types of actions. We have a filter bar, and again, there's no need to explain, for example, when is the filtering triggered, because that's already defined and implemented. At the bottom, we have something we are calling a tabbed view. It consists of a tab, title, uh, content area, and a toolbar. The layout functionality and styling is already implemented. So this is all we have to note about it. In a similar way, there was no, no need to explain how forms work. That, those were already defined as patterns. So with this system, uh, the notation kind of comes the primary source of truth for the de developers and the wireframes that are time consuming to do were becoming the secondary. It was just like an, an overview for reading the notation that, that roughly what the UI is gonna, gonna look like. It, it's a bit like the, the image was like a map, but the notation was the directions of how to get from point A to point B on the map. Exactly. So towards the end of the project, the development team uh, got familiar with the, with the notation. Also, they started to be quite familiar with the, with the UI patterns. So in some cases, we skipped doing the wireframes totally. So we just had the, had the notation, and because everyone understands what those, what those things mean, everyone was able to follow it in, in this format as well. And it worked out pretty, pretty well in some cases. Um, so this only works when the, when the whole team has a very well aligned and shared understanding of the different UI patterns that that exist. So now we have gone from, come from uh, a designer handing off a design and vanishing into having a whole team very well aligned and working together on getting this implemented. So the benefits of, of this systematic approach in general, not just to the handoff, is that, well, there's less stuff for the developers to read through because the handoff materials are minimal it's easier for them to find and create reusable implementations. Uh, the code is easier to modify and maintain, uh, and the UI design and develop, uh, implementation velocity can be significantly higher. So at the end of this project that Jose just told you about, we did a survey uh, of the whole team, of the seven developers and two de designers, of how they self-assessed their velocity in this project compared to some earlier projects they had done. And um, the result was pretty awesome. 
they self-assessed their velocity to be as high as six times of the more traditional approach where we didn't have any kind of systematic approach to patterns. So obviously they didn't have a 6x velocity compared to traditional projects uh, in the beginning because then they had to define all those patterns. But the longer the project went on, they kind of reached this uh, optimal point where we skipped doing the, uh, the wireframes and we just did the notation and the developers could just easily parse that notation and turn it into code. That's where we reached that 6 times uh, velocity. So I think if you're achieving that, you're not just nailing the handoff, you're nailing UI design and you're nailing UI development and you're nailing designer developer collaboration in general. So we'd love to take credit for this process with this methodology, but uh, except for that notation thing, we didn't invent any of this. This whole system of uh, uh, designing and implementing UI based on a standardized and well-documented set of patterns is called a design system. And I, I can imagine that many are thinking, wait, design systems are not just for designers, they're good for developers too. And yeah, um, I hope we've, we've, we've managed to convince at least some of you here about that design systems can really benefit the entire team, the entire process, the entire product. It's not just for big players like Google or Shopify. It's not just for organizations with tons of different applications. It's not just for really huge applications, although the benefits are bigger in hu bigger applications and when there's more applications. And if you already have an application and you think, well, it's too late now, well, it's not because you can also apply this retroactively in an existing application uh, if you first start with identifying the patterns that you or, or de facto have in the UI, this is called a pattern inventory. And then you basically take it from there. You start to implement those as re reusable components and gradually refactor your UI to this. And of course, you know, our uh, UI consultants can definitely help you get that process going. That's it about nailing the handoff. Do we have any questions? We are over time. We are over time. Okay. Out of time. <laughs> questions are out there. Thank you.